At the cross, Jesus painted a magnificent picture. When Jesus went to the cross, he painted this portrait of who we are and of who God is, and it utterly blows us away. Now, I, I tied in a little bit with this theme of art because this week, you see, the kids were all focused on art. Uh, they went to Spark Studios, it was called, and it was really cool on Monday. So uh, Betsy Thompson was up here. She was uh, leading things uh, for that opening ceremony, and uh, she was doing some spoken word, and we had someone was over here playing uh, on the piano. We had another uh, young lady over here was doing some dance, and all the way over here, we had a, a special artist who was here, and from a blank canvas painted. Uh, a beautiful picture. The kids loved it. It's a very cool thing. They were learning this week that they are God's creation. God is a creator. He is creative, and we are uh, there at the pinnacle of his creation. That's why he's come, and he loves us. And so when I look at the cross, I look and I see that Jesus has painted a picture of of who God is. Now I looked at this picture. This picture is only about six days old. They did that on Monday, but I wanted to show you another picture that is about a hundred years old. I couldn't believe that it was actually about a hundred years ago. I've got a picture of that right here, and uh, you may look at this painting and say, what in the world is going on over there? Now uh, you may not be able to tell what's in the picture, but I bet some of you could guess who painted that picture. Anyone have any guesses? Of, it's a famous painter. Who knows who it is? Pablo Picasso. Of course it is. He painted this painting about 100 years ago, which is surprising for me because I think he was probably ahead of his time, right? He was entering into some of the more modern, like abstract type things. I think, oh, that's pretty cool. But what he was doing with this painting, he had this huge canvas, and he wanted to say goodbye to a period of his life where he had painted in this cubism. And so he started to paint, and uh, he painted on here. I don't know if you can quite tell, but over here we've got a musician. It's a, it's a little harlequin type guy, and he's got that a violin there. He's ready to play. Then in the middle, we've got another guy kind of calls back to this style from the 1700s, and he's playing there a clarinet or an oboe. And uh, over here on the other side, on the right, uh, that's a guy, it looks like he's texting, uh, but uh, that is actually, uh, that's um, an accordion. It's a monk. You can see his little rope there. It's a monk playing an accordion, and this painting is called The Three Musicians. Three Musicians. Now, at first, when you look at this, you're like, what am I even looking at? This doesn't really look like anything I've ever seen before. But as you start to discern what it was that the artist had in mind, you start to see the things come together, and you see the unique perspective that was there. Now sometimes, we take a look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and we have the same reaction as we have to this painting. We look at the cross of Jesus Christ, a man crucified, and we say, what in the world is going on here? Someone who was innocent is crucified. Why in the world would that happen? What all is going on here? I've had those own questions in my own life. As I go around and I see crosses, huge crosses. Some churches have crosses on them. Uh, some people I saw in the first service, I saw a person with a necklace that had a cross on it. I've seen earrings with crosses on it, T-shirts. I've even seen people get a little cross uh, in their haircut at times. And as you're growing up, maybe you wonder, what is the deal with the cross? What is going on there? Maybe as a child, uh, for you, have you ever thought about this in your own life? As you try to understand and discern and interpret what's going on in the cross, maybe you, you went to a, a Good Friday service, and you think, man, what's going on here? Does this whole thing have to be so bloody and so gory? Maybe you get a little bit older and you enter into your teenage years and you start to look around and you see people who are absolutely sold out for Jesus and you start to wonder, what is it that happened at the cross that makes people want to devote their entire lives to him? Or maybe even still now, you're still scratching your head saying, I'm not quite sure what all was going on at the cross. Well, today, we're going to discover exactly what it is that we're looking at at the cross and just like Pablo Picasso painted a painting of three different musicians at the cross, Jesus, in a sense, painted a picture 
of three different truths for us. And the truths, as we put them together, we'll see our bottom line today is that at the cross, we see our worst overcome by God's best. At the cross, we see the worst that we have to offer, the sin that we've committed, the worst uh, execution device that humans have come up with, the worst reaction to the creator of the universe to kill him. And we see God's best, his love, his sacrifice, and all the promises that he fulfilled. So I'm going to ask God to be at work within our time together, ask him to speak to us through the power of his Holy Spirit. So please join me in prayer as we seek him in those things. Lord, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus. We thank you not only that he lived, but we also thank you that he died. We thank you that he died in our place, because without him, we have no hope. Lord, we turn to you today, and we want you to help us to understand what it was that you did at the cross. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Help us to grab onto these truths. Help us to see this picture that you are painting, and help us to be able to walk in light of all these things. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, I told you there's three different things, three different ways we're going to see that at the cross, we saw our worst overcome by God's best. The first thing I want to bring your attention to is this. Number one, God hates our sin. God hates sin. Sin is anything that goes against who God is, his character. So he's created us, he's given us the ability uh, to make decisions. And uh, pretty much as soon as he gave people the chance to choose things, they decided to turn away from him. We see that in Genesis with Adam and Eve. And ever since then, we've been sinning both by nature, because that's who we are right now, we can't get away from that, and by choice. So we've got this big sin problem. You know, I heard a story this last week of uh, two different guys who like to be artists. It's Jeremiah and Ryan. They love to be artists. And the way they do that, their canvas isn't like this. Their canvas is human skin, which sounds like really weird. But let me just tell you, they're tattoo artists, right? So they like making tattoos on people. They've got a tattoo parlor there in Kentucky. And so Jeremiah and Ryan, a few years back, they said, you know what? We want to open up some free appointments. If people want to come and get a tattoo, we will do that for free. We want to give people an opportunity to cover up tattoos that they regret. Whether it's tattoos that had gang symbols on there, whether it's tattoos that had flags with uh, racist connotations, whether it was swastikas or different things like that, they said, you can come and we will cover up some of those tattoos. So their first customer who came and took advantage of that was a lady who in high school got a flag with uh, some uh, negative connotations. And uh, she said, I don't know what I was thinking. I've looked down at this tattoo for 20 years, and now I'm so thankful she had it covered up, I think, uh, with a flower and maybe uh, a guy from Rick and Morty. If you ever watched that show. Well, she covered it up, and she realized she had made this mistake long ago. For 20 years, she had regretted that, but now she was able to have that covered over. And at the cross, in a similar way, Jesus gives us the opportunity for the things that we've regretted, for the things that we know we've done wrong and looked back to. God hates those things, and he gave through Jesus an opportunity for those sins to be covered over, for those sins to be removed. Uh, if you've got your copy of God's Word with you, uh, your Bible or your Bible app, I want to invite you to open up with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And in John chapter 19, we're going to continue to see the day, the time, the moment, the hour when Christ went to the cross for us. We, we uh, take a look here, and we're going to start it up in verse 16 there at the end. John 19, verse 16. It says, So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. We're not sure why it was called the place of the skull. Uh, maybe a lot of other people had died there. Uh, maybe there was a rock formation that kind of looked like a skull, 
But either way, we re realize that Jesus is headed to his death. And our passage tells us that there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. A lot of times these different uh, criminals, people who had been convicted, they would carry that crossbar. They would carry it all the way to the cross. Typically there was a 10-foot high post that would stay there, and they would nail the criminals to those things. And the criminals would have hanging around their neck uh, the description of what they had done wrong. So if someone had been a thief, if someone had been a murderer, it would be listed on there so that everyone who walked past would know, I for sure am not going to do that crime because I know how it will turn out for me. But here's the thing. As Jesus was led to the cross and the nails pierced his hands and his feet and they lifted him up, there was an inscription for what, he had been, what uh, crime he had committed, what was incriminating there in his circumstance. And Pilate had written an inscription and put it on the cross, and it said this, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now this is incredible because here we see Jesus of Nazareth starting from what seemingly was a humble beginnings, right? The town of Nazareth was not one that had a whole lot of pride to it. People weren't excited about being from Nazareth. There's a lot of humility there, but Jesus has gone from being in this humble place now to being, being proclaimed as the king of the Jews. And Pilate put that on there because as we talked about last week, Pilate believed some of the things that were true about Jesus. He was there, and he believed some of the things, but he finally caved in to pressure from others. He cared more about his own career and what others thought of him. But he wrote those things, and so many people were walking by. If you guys have ever been to like a 4th of July parade, you know, hey, just a ton of people are converging on uh, the parade site, right? Everybody's trying to sp find a spot to sit. Everybody's going to look around. Some of you are going to go to fireworks and you just see a whole bunch of people. Well, there were crowds over there. Uh, I think I mentioned to you previously, some would estimate that maybe even up to a million people would be coming to visit in Jerusalem at that time. So, so many people are coming in and out and going past on the streets where Jesus would have been crucified. And if they looked up, they would read this inscription because it was written not only in one language, but in three languages, in Aramaic, in Greek, and in Latin. From the very get-go, the ministry of Jesus Christ from the cross was an international ministry for people all over the world, for people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And so the chief priests, the Jews, they're like, oh, wait, 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 Pilate, you got this wrong. They're like, you put something up there. You said this guy's the king of the Jews, but please, can you clarify that this guy claims to be the king of the Jews? We don't think he's the king of the Jews, so please don't put that on there. But what's Pilate's response? What I have written, I have written. Some of us have said that before, right? I said what I said. It is what it is. This is where I put it, and that's what Pilate has to say. Jesus has said many times, it is written, it is written, and now again it's being written accurately about Jesus that he is the king not only of the Jews, but the king overall. Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. You know, it's crazy, because the reason Jesus went to the cross, it's not just because he had nothing better to do, it's not just because it was on his checklist and he said, well, let me just get that taken care of. He went to the cross because it was the only way for our sin to be addressed. We just sang a few minutes ago, it was my sin that held him there. And it's true, our sin is the reason that Jesus went to the cross. Of course, it was also his love, his uh, uh, tremendous, overwhelming love for his children that we didn't deserve, but he gave to us just because of who he is that also held him at the cross. But I've asked that question sometimes, like, why did it have to be so brutal? 
Why did it have to be so gory? Why did he have to shed his blood? Of course, we saw in the Old Testament that there were uh, sacrifices that were made, right? The lambs, even we hear about that, that it's the, it's the Passover day, that there are lambs being killed all throughout Jerusalem on this day to say, hey, here's a temporary covering for my sin. Here's a temporary covering. If you've ever taken out your credit card, you say you got a purchase and you're like, you know what? I don't quite have the money in my bank right now. So I'm going to swipe my credit card and that's my promise. I'm going to pay for this later. And so for so many years in the nation of Israel, these animal sacrifices had been made and basically was their way of saying, hey, we're not able to cover for our sin 100% right now, but we're trusting God's going to pay for it later. And when Jesus comes here, he says, hey, I'm ready. I'm ready to pay this bill in full. And so that's why Jesus went to the cross, to care for our sin. Isaiah 53 tells us really nicely. Isaiah 53, hundreds of years previous, tells us what was going to go on at the cross. It says this, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced with those nails. And a little bit later on with a spear. He was pierced for our transgressions. That's a fancy word for sin. He was crushed for our iniquities. The weight of our sin put on him, crushing him. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, this is why Jesus had to go to the cross, with his wounds, we are healed. This was the way for us to experience healing and spiritual forgiveness was by Jesus going to the cross. You know, maybe you're here today, and like that lady who had a tattoo on her leg that she regretted for so 20 years, maybe you've been carrying around with you in a proverbial backpack the weight of some of the things that you've done wrong, things that you regret, things that you wish you could go back and change, but you can't. Maybe it's uh, the way that you treated your parents as you were growing up, or even still as an adult. Maybe it's the way that you treated your kids, and you wish, I wish I, could, I, wish I, wish, I wish I could go back and change that. Maybe it's the guilt of past illicit relationships, things that never should have happened, or things that are going on online that never should be taking place. Maybe it's some of the words that come out of our mouth, whether it's four-letter words or the tone that we have with our family members being harsh instead of loving and patient and kind. Well, whatever it is that you've been carrying around, I want you to know that at the cross, Jesus saw the depth of our sin. He saw how bad we have done things, and he said, yes, I see you. I see what you've done wrong, and I take that on myself. I'm going to bear the brunt of that. God's wrath that is supposed to be going towards you, I'm going to take that on myself instead. And that's, what we see Jesus taking that sin upon himself so that's a little bit about the worst right that's not too good (laughs) that's some bad news God's seen the stuff that we've done wrong and Jesus had to die in our place but there's another thing that we see thankfully thankfully that's not the end of the story is our worst Without Jesus, the story does end with us stuck with our worst. But instead of our worst soon, now we see the second thing I want you to see. And that's that Jesus loves his people. At the cross, we see God's best unfolding. And part of God's best is that Jesus loves his people with a sacrificial love. I heard about a story that uh, happened about 10 years ago. There's a guy named uh, David Saunders lived up in Michigan, and uh, he was ready to go get his four-year-old daughter from the bus stop. The bus had pulled up across the street from their house, and a little pickup truck had pulled up right behind there. So he went around the front of the bus, got his daughter, his four-year-old daughter, Danielle, and they walked back over into their driveway. And as they were standing there, there came a car that was coming too quickly, And this car was going so fast that uh, they realized they were not going to be able to stop in time to avoid hitting this truck. So they turned off to the left, headed straight for the father and his daughter. And without even having to think about it twice, this father threw his daughter over into the yard and took the full brunt of that car. 
and he died. He died to sacrifice his life so that his daughter could live. And that's a tragic story. It's a tragic story. This man, of course, made a decision, a split-second decision, to say, I care so much about my daughter, I would sacrifice my life for her. And he did that. But the reason that something like that is so heartbreaking for us is because death is a serious thing. Death, to be separated from life, both in a physical sense, to be separated from physical life, that's a serious thing. But all of us, not only were we destined for physical death, but we also were existing in spiritual death, being separated from life. Who is life? God is life. He is the author of life, and being connected to him is the only way that we can be spiritually alive. And so Jesus came, and just as that loving father said, I will allow myself to take the full brunt of this, Jesus showed his love for his people at the cross. Uh, We're going to continue in our passage, so uh, take a look back in John chapter 19, verse 23. And it says this, When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. Now, Jesus probably had his sandals that he normally would have been walking with, probably had his uh, outer garments, probably a a huge rectangle that kind of would drape over his shoulders, probably had a covering that he would uh, put over his head at times, and he probably had a belt. And so that's four things, right? So they divide it up for those four soldiers. But there's one thing that's left, and that's his tunic. And so this tunic was one that was so nice, they said, let's not rip this thing up. Let's gamble to see who it is that's going to get this. And of course, they gambled for his garments. One of them won, and they were able to take Jesus' tunic. But you know what's really interesting? Why would the author of John spend this time talking about how nice Jesus' tunic was? It was a tunic that was woven from top to bottom. It was a really special garment. Now, John has taken some time to talk about some other bits of cloth During this time, we see, of course, the cloth that symbolically was untied when Lazarus came out of the grave. These cloths of death that he was wrapped in symbolically came off. It's amazing. He also brings our attention to a cloth, a a servant cloth, that Jesus took around his waist as he took the posture of a servant to do even the most low of servanthood towards his disciples to wash their feet. I believe it was just last week we saw that as the soldiers were mocking Jesus for being the king of the Jews, they put on him, what was it? A purple cloth, joking that he was the king. And it seems that John is bringing attention to the tunic of Jesus because the word that's said here, woven, is only used in one other place in Scripture. And that is to talk about, get this, the clothing of the high priests the clothing of the high priests. And so what it seems is happening is that in this moment, as Jesus is taking off this tunic, it's a signal that he is finishing up his high priestly work here on earth. Now, if you don't know what a priest is, a priest is someone when people need to talk to God, uh, we're sinful, we can't be in his presence, so God said, I'll allow a priest to come and talk to me. So we would make sacrifices, and the priest would represent us before God. And instead of us needing another human high priest, if you want to know more about this, read the book of Hebrews. It's a good one. And Jesus now is our high priest. And so it seems that at this moment, as he's taking off this special woven tunic, he's signaling the end of his high priestly work here on earth and the beginning of his eternal high priestly work. It's amazing. Just a few minutes ago, we, see, we were seeing that uh, Jesus is the king. He's the king that's been promised. The king that we need is proclaimed right above him, that he is the king. And now we see that Jesus is the high priest that we need, the one who will represent us before God for all time. Of course, this fulfilled a prophecy in Psalm chapter 22. And as I read this prophecy that was written hundreds of years before, I want you to think, hmm, do these verses represent what's going on at the cross? Psalm 22, verse 16 says, A company of evildoers surround me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. My my body is exposed. 
They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. This prophecy is fulfilled here as these soldiers were doing it. They're simply doing what God said long ago they were going to do. But not only do we see Jesus as the king, not only do we see his tunic coming off so that, uh, so that uh, it's representing the fact that he is the high priest, we also see Jesus taking this moment to have some final words with some of his closest loved ones. In this moment at the cross, verse 25 tells us who's there. Because standing by his cross were his mother, that's Mary, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So a lot of Marys here, right? And I'm not sure if the other disciples were too scared to get close or if the soldiers were keeping most of them back. The Gospel of Luke tells us that most of the disciples were standing from a long way off. They were really scared because Jesus had told them all these great things that were going to happen and they were waiting for all that to happen and now they're watching Jesus be crucified and they're trying to figure out as we try to figure out what in the world is going on at the cross. And Jesus takes a moment to speak to some of these loved ones, and he has something very important to tell them. Now remember, Jesus has siblings. Jesus has other uh, brothers and sisters who would be able to take care of his mother Mary. So why does he take the time here with some of his final breaths as he's held there on the cross struggling to breathe, struggling to take in the oxygen that he needs, why would he take the time to point out these things? He says to his mother, woman. Now that's a respectful term, but he doesn't say mom, mother, Mary. He says woman, and in some ways he is distancing himself from her. He says, woman, behold your son. This is the disciple that Jesus loved. We believe it's John. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now here's the thing. We see his love. We see he's caring for the people who are there, who had been close to him, to his disciples. Mary Magdalene, one of the most faithful disciples of Jesus. Just wait until you see the role that she gets to have in the resurrection of Jesus. But Jesus, it seems, is taking, based on the way this is written, he's taking the time not just to make sure that someone's going to take care of his mom, but Jesus is making it clear that when he went to the cross, he inaugurated a new season of the family of God. He gave Mary a chance and John a chance and his other disciples to be within the family of God, to be children of God. It's amazing how that opens up because not only they are able to experience being a part of the family of God, but you and I are able to experience that as well. That's why when we're shaking hands, we say, hey, good morning, brother, good morning, sister. Hey, it's my spiritual father, my spiritual mother. We have the older ones teaching the younger ones. We are part of the family of God. And actually, if you could believe this, all the way since the very beginning of our series, almost 10 months ago, in John chapter 1, we got a glimpse that this was going to come together, that we were going to have the opportunity to be a part of God's family, to be children of God. What does it say in John chapter 1, verse 12? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, that's us believers, he gave the right to become children of God. Through the cross, we see not only that Jesus loved the people who were right there with him, not only that he loved us so much that he would die, but we see his love continuing on for all time within the family of God. It's a beautiful thing. He shared the love for us. With the weight of our sin coming his way, he pushed us out of the way and took the consequences of our sin upon himself. <clears throat> you know, maybe you're here today, and maybe your family didn't turn out the way that you wanted it to. Maybe you wish that you had children, and maybe you were never able to do that. Maybe your relationship with your father or with your mother or with your grandparents is not what you wish 
that it was. Maybe there's brokenness there. Maybe you have a spouse or you used to have a spouse who treated you in a way either by leaving you or by, by not being all that they should have been within that relationship that you feel as though you have been failed in that. Well, of course, together as a church, we work hard to care for one another, to seek to see God's restorative hand, restoring relationships, restoring marriages, relationships with parents and with children. But one of the things that we see within this passage is that Jesus gives us not only healing at times within our physical families, but he gives us a spiritual family, family of brothers and sisters, those who come together together, care for one another regardless of if we're from the same mom or not and we care for one another and for all of eternity we have the opportunity to be a part of God's family to be children of God to experience sonship to be his heirs of all the spiritual blessings that he has for us so if you have turned to Jesus if you've turned to Jesus to save you then you are a part of God's family and we're able to enjoy that together we're children of God, and God loves you. It's an amazing and beautiful thing. At the cross, we see that Jesus loves his people. We see the severity of sin. We see the depth of God's love for his people. And finally, we see another thing that's been in, work, in the works for thousands of years. For thousands of years, God has been making promises. And at the cross, we see that God keeps his promises. God keeps the promises to his people. You know somebody who's really good at keeping track of promises? My kids. My kids are really good at keeping track of what promises I've made. If I say anything about ice cream when we get home, they remember that really well. If I say anything about some candy or uh, some suckers, they remember it really well. If I say anything about, hey, we're going to Chick-fil-A and we're going to play on that play place, you better believe they're going to remember it. They may not be too good at remembering picking up their socks, putting their clothes away, making their bed. I'm not sure why. That one just isn't remembered quite as well. But when I make promises, they remember those things. Even if it's like a consequence for their sibling, they're like, hey, weren't they supposed to, you know, have a time out? Weren't they supposed to lose a privilege? They remember that one pretty good, too. But here's the thing. God the Father is a father who makes promises to his children, and he comes through on those every time. That's a couple of things I've learned in my own promises. Number one, be careful with the promises you make. And number two, come through on your promises. God the Father comes through on all of his promises. Now, you may be in a place today where you're like, yeah, I'm waiting for God to fulfill his promises. I'm trusting to him to be at work within my life. I have some areas where I'm struggling, and I'm waiting for God to be at work. I'm waiting for God's promises to show up. I'm waiting him to be faithful in each of these areas, and I want you to know our God is a God who keeps his promises. From the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, a promise is made in Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve, they uh, fall apart and they sin. They give in to that. The promise is made, the, the proto-evangelion, the first gospel, that there will be one who will come one day that will be from the offspring of Eve who will come and who will overcome not only sin but the evil one and will make things right. God is the God who is keeping that promise. When a promise was made to King David that there would be a king who would come from his, his line who would rule forever and ever, Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And when the angel came to Mary and said, yes, your son is going to be named Jesus and he's going to be a savior and he is going to be a king and he's going to be on his throne forever and ever. I wonder what Mary was thinking as she looked up at the cross and saw her son crucified. And she's wondering, God, are you going to come through on your promises? God, are you going to keep your promises to me? Because this sure doesn't look like you're getting the victory, God. There are moments within our lives when we see moments and experiences and we look around and we say, God, are you really coming through? God, I'm waiting for you to be at work. Are you going to come through? And I want you to know God keeps his promises. Within these final few verses of our passage today, we see a handful of fulfilled prophecies 
or promises. Verse 28 says this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he's in the home stretch, he's about to complete his saving work here, he said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And when he said that he was thirsty, that fulfills Psalm 22, 15. He said, my strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. He was thirsty in this moment. We also see another fulfilled prophecy that they gambled for his clothes. That's what we saw in Psalm 22. For my clothing, they cast lots. Another thing we see is that they didn't break Jesus' bones. Here at the end of this, uh, Jesus is there on the cross. A lot of times the Romans would leave those people who had been crucified, they would leave them on the cross just indefinitely so that as their bodies decompose, people would be horrified by the effects of crime. But the, the religious leaders say, hey, if we've got dead bodies out here, it's going to defile the land. We want to go home and we want, we want to enjoy our Passover meal. And so can we please get these bodies off the cross? Let's make sure they're dead. And so what the Romans would do, they would come and probably with the hammer, they would break the legs of these people so they no longer had the strength to be able to lift themselves up and breathe. And so as their legs were broken, uh, they would no longer be able to breathe and they would suffocate in that moment. But when they came to Jesus, Jesus had already, what? Given up his spirit. In verse 30, Jesus had received the sour wine and he said, It is finished. It's one word in the original language, tetelestai. It's all done. That's what you would write if you check something off the list. It is done. It is finished. The job is complete. It's paid in full. Tetelestai. He cried this out. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. His spirit wasn't taken from him. He willingly gave his spirit. The sacrifice had been paid. There's no longer anything for us to do. It's not that we need to do lots of good works to try to earn God's favor. I'm going to try to do a lot of good things and hopefully my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. No, we just saw a few minutes ago, God hates sin. There's no way for us to deal with it on our own. And so Jesus, in this moment, finished his work on the cross the soldiers came they broke the legs of the other men and when they came to jesus they saw that he was already dead so they took a spear and they pierced him in his side and they probably would have come underneath the ribs and pierced all the way up because what they knew was that if they punctured the heart they would wait to see as people were on the cross and the heart was racing and beating so hard to try to get oxygen and blood to keep that person alive that heart would have gone into overdrive and when that person died and they punctured that heart, out of his side would flow blood and water. And that would show that this person was really dead. It's really important that we know Jesus really did die. That the sacrifice, his life really was given for us. And John takes an entire verse to make sure we know it was the real deal. Verse 35 says, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. These things took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. We see that coming from Psalm 34. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. And finally, the fourth prophecy that we see fulfilled within these few verses is that they pierced his side. Zechariah chapter 12 gives us another picture of what's going on in this moment. Now remember, this is prophesied hundreds of years before. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him. God made these prophecies long before the birth of Christ, even before a crucifixion was even invented. These prophecies were made. And God came through on his promises. Jesus is the Savior that we need. He's the Lamb of God who takes our place. Not only is the high priest who represents us before God and makes a sacrifice, he's the high priest who himself is sacrificed for us so that we might live. And so if you're wondering, God keeps his promises. When he made these prophecies, like I said, to Adam and to Eve, he is the fulfillment of that. When he made these promises, 
uh, again, that not only would he be killed, but that he would rise again on the third day. He came through on that promise, that promise when he promised to forgive everyone who would turn to Jesus in faith and repentance. He comes through on that promise. And when Jesus promised before he ascended into heaven that behold, he is with us always to the end of the age, he sent his Holy Spirit to make sure that his presence would be with us for the rest of of time at the cross we see that god keeps his promises so what a beautiful picture has been painted for us what a beautiful picture we see here you know if you've never placed your faith in jesus before if you've looked at the cross for years and you say i don't really understand why jesus did that but if you now understand you can turn to him for salvation you can pray to him in the quietness of your heart you can say god i believe that you created me to know you and to worship you. I believe that because of my sin, I've fallen short of your standard. I believe that there's nothing I can do to save myself. But I believe that you sent your perfect son, Jesus Christ, to die in my place, to raise again from the dead, showing that he has victory over sin and death. And God, I, I repent of my sin and I place my faith in Jesus completely. And I know that because of what Jesus did on the cross, I'm forgiven, and I'm now in a right relationship with God. That's what it means to turn to Jesus. That's what it means to be forgiven. That's what it means to become one of his disciples and to have guaranteed for us his promise of eternal life that we are able to experience forevermore. If you've trusted Jesus for the very first time today, I want to say welcome to the family of God. We've been a part of the family of God, and we are enjoying this not only today, but for all of eternity. At the cross, what a beautiful picture it is that God's painted, not only of the ugliness of our sin, but the beauty of redemption available through the blood of Jesus.